recording here. Okay, we're recording now. This is Monday, March 29th. This is our Math 208 Elementary Statistics class session. Uh, you are working, after you hand in homework number nine, you're gonna work on an exam this week. So these two sessions, Monday and Wednesday, 12.30 to 2.00, are just to answer questions you have before and after you start working on the exam. So let's go over just the list of deadlines so you can keep everything straight. We're going to use exactly the same format that we used for exam one. And that is you have a homework you're working on right now that you're gonna hand in by tomorrow night at 11.59. That's homework number nine, written homework number nine. It's on our website. And about the time you hand that in, maybe somewhere between 11.30 and 12, 11.30 and 11.59 p.m., I'll post exam two to our website on week 12. The instructions for exam two are already posted on our website and they are the same instructions we used for exam one, so there's nothing different about that. You have seven days to work on exam two, so that'll be due 11.59 on Tuesday, April 6th, and that'll be due in our Math 208 assignments folder as we normally submit homeworks and papers. Uh, you can also remember that if you're working on the Newton Alta assignments, the recommended completion for the first 22 of those was today by 11.59. So regardless of where you are in that, our recommendation was you had done 22 of the 30 assignments. By this point in the semester, you can work on it until the last Monday of the semester. And I'll put on your next grade report what your current rate of completion is on that. So you can still work on it. You can still work on all 30 assignments, but time is slipping away and April is the last month of our class. So make sure that you get the most out of that credit that you can get. You can score 100% in all those assignments and that's a boost to your grade. So, Having said all that, I don't have anything I want to say to you, but I'm willing to do any problems in the book you want to look at. I will say uh, one thing that confused me in the book. It, it's not an error. It's something you should be careful about. In the book, section 10.3, number 111. That problem, you could say technically should be in section 10.1. I don't know whether they were testing you to see if you were paying attention to that or if they just made an error when they edited and pasted together the book, but look closely at problem 111 in 10.3. That's your second homework problem. When I look at it, you're not going to use the method of 10.3, you're gonna use the method of 10.1. So just pay attention to that. Uh, I don't know how to say that. Let me say that here. Should this problem be using the method of section 10.3 or section 10.1? I'll let you decide. I thought it fit better in section 10.1. Okay, 
other than that, I also sent some detailed notes earlier this morning about the most recent homework, which is posted in your Google Drive folders. So if you have any, you may or may not have picked up those homeworks yet, but if you have any questions on that, we can preview that. So I will, and I'm not being pushy at all because this is a completely optional session, but I'll open the floor to any questions anyone wants to submit. There must be oh, ambulance or fire outside or relatively nearby. So let me shut the window in the other room. It probably reduces the noise a little bit. <sighs> you can come and go and ask questions as you like. I'm just doing paperwork and checking answers to the homeworks that you're doing here on my desk. So I can just work quietly while you're working or while you're looking through problems.
I don't mean to interrupt you or anything, Braden, but I'm just sitting here doing some calculation with that funny degrees of freedom and I figured out I entered something wrong. So that's something you have to be really careful about when you have that strange formula in 10.1 and previously in chapter nine about degrees of freedom. I'm just practicing some problem here.
Uh, let me look at that. Thank you. That's probably something useful. Uh, the question is about problem 122 in chapter 10. Let's read it. And if necessary, we'll pull it up on screen. And we need to decide what kind of problem that is. So let me take some notes here. And then we'll take a look at it. This is a particular problem where you are comparing two things side by side. So the book identifies this from section 10.4. And I just got done telling you that in 111, they identified from section 10.3 and I don't agree. But I do agree that this is from section 10.4, chapter 10. So this is a problem, what's called a matched pair problem, where they give you a pair of data or two pieces of data about one object or two competing pieces of data about one object that you're sampling. So maybe it would be handy for the sake of the recording to read this together on our screen. So let me do that. This is a very good problem. So I'm pulling up a PDF copy of the book and I'm looking at chapter 10 and looking at the problems and sliding down to 122. And then I'll share that with you. Okay, 114 here, we're getting close. 120, 121, one more page, 122. Okay, let me resize that window and then share it with you. You'll see what I mean by matched pairs. So I'm sharing this window with you now. A slightly different setup today. So apologize for the hesitation. I want to make sure that I am sharing this window with you. So I'm going to bring in another screen that I can get a better idea exactly what you're seeing. Okay. So I'm in that, I'm in that, I'm in that. Okay, so I, it's important. I just wanna make sure I see what I think you're seeing and I'm recording what I think I'm recording. So here's the problem. A traveler wants to know if the prices of hotels are different in 10 cities that he or she visits most often. So the person took the list of cities they visit most often and compare hotel prices for two favorite hotel chains, uh, which seem a bit pricey. <laughs> Maybe it's a business traveler some type of executive. So we have these two prices. You know, some are higher, Hilton, Hyatt Regency, Hilton. Sometimes the Hilton is higher, like Atlanta. Sometimes the Hyatt Regency is higher, like Boston. And you can't always make sense out of the prices of things like hotels or rental cars. So this person wants to know if the hotel prices are different. And even that tells me something. So let's check out our keywords. I'm writing this on the paper and I'll get back to my paper in a second. 
and it gives you the cities, the prices. I think it's not going to be hard to enter those numbers in the calculator when we need to enter the numbers in the calculator, right? And I think I'll be able to let the calculator compare those objects. What I'm interested in is the differences. What's called the distribution of the differences. And if the prices were essentially the same in those cities, you know, higher in this city, lower in that city, if they were overall the same, then the distribution of differences, the sample difference would be zero. But I can tell by performing a test whether the difference between the two cities on the average tends to be positive or negative. So I'm going to go to a different page in the book. You know, before I leave that, why don't we simply enter those cities into my calculator right now? So I'm going to open up the calculator screen version. And then I can put this table away so we don't have to read it again. So open up the screen version of my calculator. It's going to pop up here in a second. And then I'll share that with you. Got it. Sharing. Clear the picture. Clear that screen. OK. Clear this screen. Now I'm sharing the calculator. Let me go and enter those two lists. So edit. Looks like I've got three lists already set up here. And actually, it's from a similar problem. So do you see that I have a first list, list one, second list, list two, and then list three is list two minus list one. This is a problem that we might have done previously. So I'm going to clear each of these lists and enter these hotel prices in these 10 cities. So first, the Hyatt Regency prices in those 10 cities, 107, 107, whoops, 107. Okay, now I'm on target, 358. 209, 209, 167. 179, 179, 625. Okay, that's New York City. 179, 179, 625. Okay, what do we got next? 179, 245. That finishes that list. 179, I'm going to make sure I enter that correctly. 245. And scan it to make sure I entered it correctly so I don't screw up later. Looks good. Now let's enter the prices for the same cities in the same order, but at Hilton, which are 169289299, 169, 289, and then next batch, 198169214, 198, 169, 214, 214, missed a keystroke there. Uh, one six nine four five nine one five nine one six nine four five nine one five nine and the last one two three nine. So I'm interested in the differences between the cities. Sometimes one's higher, sometimes the other higher, but on the average, is the difference between cities zero since I have to visit each city anyway, apparently. So let's go to list three and let's make list three equal to list two minus list one. I could do that in another order. Here there's no before and after, but I'll just say Hyatt in the first column, Hilton in the second column, and I'll take the Hilton price minus the Hyatt price each time. What do I got? You see that sometimes 
I have a positive difference. That means Hilton price is higher, L2. Sometimes I have a negative distance difference. That means Hyatt Regency price is higher. That's the negative 69. L1 is higher by $69. What I want to know is on the whole, does this average out to zero? And remember, this is just a sample. Okay, so let's go set up on a paper. Now that I have this ready on my calculator, when I need it, let's go set this up on the paper according to section 10.4. So I could bring back the book for you in a second after I have section 10.4 up. Let me get that section 10.4 open for you. Table of contents 10.4. And here's where he talks about matched pairs of samples. Stop sharing calculator, go back to sharing book. So when you're sharing or analyzing, testing some matched samples, some paired samples, you're doing a simple random test and his random test was hotel prices on a particular night, not anything special. Sample sizes are often small. You're comparing two small groups. This was 10 hotel prices at one chain and 10 hotel prices in another chain. These two measurements were drawn from the same pair of individuals, Hilton and the Hyatt Regency. Hyatt Regency in the first list, Hilton in the second list. And then I can calculate the difference from the pairs that I've already done in the calculator. And the differences are what I'm going to use for my hypothesis test. I'm assuming that the matched pairs are coming from a population that is normal or the differences. I have sufficiently many differences in the hotel chain nights. Yes, I can sample any night I choose on the calendar and that those distributions are approximately normal or normal. So let's write this down on the paper. Let's go back to my paper now. I'm gonna write this on the paper and then switch. My test statistic, it's a t-test, is the mean of the differences minus the mean of the differences in the sample minus the mean of the differences in the population divided by the standard deviation of the differences over the square root of the number of samples. Okay, now we're ready to roll on the paper. Uh, not sharing, stop sharing. Okay, good, not stop the session, okay. So these are the things that made me identify matched pairs. I saw the 10 cities. I saw two hotel chains, Hyatt and Hilton. And I had prices from each hotel chain in each of those 10 cities. I want to know are these prices on the average different? So I'm looking at the distribution of differences. So I created a third column that had the differences between those hotels. Now let's go back to the problem and set up our hypothesis test and our level of significance. I think they gave us for level of significance 1%. So they were being very, very tight. Let's get back to problem 122. I won't reshare that screen with you. I just want to read. I just want to remember that I got that correctly, 1%. Yes, they want us to test at the alpha equals 1% level of significance. And when it says, are these two means different? What they're asking for 
is, is this mean of differences equal to zero? Or is it different than zero? Do I have any evidence that on the whole, those two cities are the same? Or do I have diff do I have evidence that there's a difference between the hotel chain prices in those 10 cities? So the other thing you should notice about this immediately, make sure I write this down on my paper, is this is a two-tailed test. Whenever you have the null hypothesis being equal and the alternative hypothesis being not equal, two-tailed test. If it was strictly greater than zero or less than zero, that's right tail test or left tail test. So let's see what this represents. Okay, what do I need to compute my test statistic? And then I'll do this on the calculator and we could also do this in decimals. I need four numbers here, right? The mean of the differences, the standard deviation of the differences, the number, of pairs that I sampled, there was 10 cities. I also need the mean of the population differences, but I'm assuming that that's zero. I'm assuming across all nights, Hyatt and Hilton at those 10 cities, I have no difference in the various cities I visit. So this is zero right here. And I just need to plug in these three numbers. The mean of the differences, standard deviation of the differences, and the square root of 10. I'd be really careful that you put that fraction in the strictly in the bottom of that denominator. I'll show you how to do that on the calculator. First, I need to get the mean of the differences and the standard deviation of differences. So let me move on to another paper here. That's a good example from section 10.4. Okay, good. So let's go back to the calculator. And I have list three, the difference is already computed. So I'm just gonna do my statistics, one variable on list three. So I'm going to calculate one variable statistics. Make sure I'm using list three. And I must have been doing a previous problem like this. So I already had list three typed into that space. There's no frequency list. Let's calculate and record. I'll write this on my paper, then I'll come back to the paper. It says the mean of differences is minus 9.3. So on average, the difference was negative. That's Hilton minus Hyatt. So if Hilton minus Hyatt was negative, then what? A Hyatt was more expensive. But this could just be a sample. Is that a significant difference? That's what we're about to calculate. Standard deviation of the differences, they list on the calculator as 70.9. I'll use the standard four decimal places, 70.9320, if I round it off to four decimal places. I can use the exact numbers also if I want. The N here is 10. So now I'll write that into my test statistic. I quit and I'm gonna show you how to do this in a fun way on your calculator too, but minus 9.3 divided by the combination of SD 70.9320 divided by the square root of N, and N here was 10. 
So notice how I very carefully put the SD divided by square root n inside the parentheses inside the denominator. What do we got here? Oops, we've got a syntax error. I can tell you where that syntax error is. Let's go look at it. That minus sign, I always type on my keyboard and I use the subtraction key on the right column instead of the minus sign on the bottom column. Let's replace that with a minus sign. Do you see it's a little smaller? Now let's crank that number. The test statistic is minus 0 0.4146. But before we leave this screen, I want to show you something. It's like you might be nervous. You round it off. You round it off with that 70.9320. Well, look under this variables key. I could type in X bar, S, and N from this very handy key here called variables. Look under variable statistics, number five. And the calculator keeps a list of the last n it used, of the last x bar it used, of the last standard deviation, both sample and population that it used. So I could literally choose x bar divided by special parentheses, variables, statistics, standard deviation, divided by square root, even grab the N from the statistics list. Now, I don't think you need to be this obsessive, but what I'm doing right here is I'm using all the digits. I'm not rounding anything off. I'm using all the digits that were stored in the calculator. Result, 4146, uh, four, you know, no difference until way down here in the sixth digit. So I'm comfortable that first four digits are correct either way. So let's go back to my paper now. This is our test statistic. Now, in the morning, when I sent you the email, I wanted you to think carefully about what you're comparing when you're doing these tests. So let me draw a very raw graph for you and then we'll compare it to a calculator drawn graph in a second. So this is a t-test. We're doing a t-test right here. We're doing a t-distribution. And the degrees of freedom that we're using right here, excuse me. I want to make sure I'm recording the same thing. I have 10 for my n, so the degrees of freedom is 9, right? Yes. Degrees of freedom is 9. So I'm looking at the t distribution, t sub 9. And that's very much like a bell shaped curve. But it's like a bell-shaped curve with slightly wider tails than the standard normal distribution. I'm not drawing this well here at all. That's why I'm gonna let the calculator draw in a second. And it's centered at zero. And one standard deviation, either way, chops this up into pieces negative 4146, this is minus one, minus two, minus three. We'll draw it on the calculator in a second. Minus 4146 is about right here. So let's check this out. That is a very large area here. Remember this area is called my p-value. And I'm going to compare the p-value 
and the alpha. The alpha was 0.1, 1%. I wanted to be accurate in that sense. And this area that I've just shaded, I can tell it's way more than 1% of this curve. But let's write down the actual value of that. So I go to calculator. I go to my, oh, let me share the calculator with you again so you can see that screen. Go to my distributions and look at the cumulative T distribution, number six. I'll also show you how to perform this test exactly on the calculator and go from the far left, negative infinity to negative, let me use the right negative this time, 0.4146. Got it. Degrees of freedom in this problem is nine. Now let's find out what this area is. This area is 0 0.3441. Thirty-four percent of this bell-shaped curve is below this test statistic, negative 0 0.4146. So sometimes you guys were unsure about what numbers you were comparing. When we do a hypothesis test, we're comparing the p-value, the alpha, and here, Sorry, I drew it the wrong way. The p-value is definitely bigger than alpha. So was this negative difference that I recorded unusual or completely within the realm of random chance? When the p-value is bigger than alpha, then I just have a difference that's due to random chance. So I do not reject the null hypothesis. And let me say that in English. I don't have enough evidence to say that the difference is not zero. What was my null hypothesis? I was assuming that the hotel prices on average between these two chains was zero on average they're about the same price. By doing this test, I see that I cannot contradict that. So let's say that in English. There is sufficient evidence. I'm sorry, let's say it the correct way. There is insufficient evidence Two, let me go back to my paper now. Conclude that the hotel prices between these two chains is different. Different what? Different on average. Clearly all the prices were different, but the average of the differences, I cannot say with any certainty that there's a difference when you average them out. Okay, good. Let me draw one more thing on this picture right here. And then we're gonna do the test on the calculator and we're gonna do the graph on the calculator. Remember, I was comparing this area to 1% of the area. 1% of the area of this T distribution must be pretty small, but you may be curious where would you draw the line to get 1% of the area? So I go back to my calculator to show you. That would be under distribution. Inverse T distribution, number four. 
and I want an area to the left of 1%, and the degrees of freedom in this distribution is nine. So this will tell me about where the marker should be placed, 2.8. 214. So that's about right here. 2.8214 negative. This is my T alpha. This is my critical marking place. 1% of the area is to the left of that number. The 34% of the area is this whole tail. This is a tinier tail. This is my, let me go back to my drawing. This is my critical value. Now I wanna draw this nicely on the calculator or Desmos. And I also wanna perform the T test on the calculator. So I said this in the note that I put up this morning. I don't have any problem if you want to use your calculator to check your work. We've done the work right here. Do not reject H naught. These are the values. This is the picture. But can I confirm this on the calculator? There's a test in the calculator that will do all this automatically for me. I go back to sharing my calculator screen. And let me clear some stuff up here so that I can have a fresh screen. Look under stats, tests. And what we did right here was a T test. A simple T test on the distribution of differences. So let's have the calculator calculate and draw this for me. Notice that the calculator has already put in all these numbers. It used what? The values of X bar, S, and N that it had most recently seen. Now be careful when the calculator does things for you automatically that you have the right information there. But this is what I want. I'm assuming that the mu of the differences is zero. I'm assuming, because I calculated it, I know that this mean of the differences is minus 9.3. The standard deviation of the differences was 70.932 rounded off. There was 10 cities that I sampled. The only thing that the calculator didn't plug in for me is I'm doing a difference test. I'm doing a two-tailed test. I want to check to see if the mean is different than zero. So let me highlight that and then hit the calculate button. And if I'm doing everything correctly, the calculator is going to reproduce all the numbers we just did, but you know, very quickly. And here they are. Let's check them out. I'm doing the first line of the calculator says you're testing to see if the mean is not zero. And the test statistic the calculator says is minus 0 0.4146. That's exactly what we calculated. The p value. Now, I got to have to use a little bit of reading right here. Oh, OK. I did something wrong, but I only erred on the side of caution. This is a two-tailed test, right? I forgot to use that fact. Two-tailed test means I could miss below or I could miss above. So I have to shade all of this area below negative 0 0.4146 and above positive 0 0.4146. When I shade all that area, this area over here is also 3441. I have to go back to my drawing for a second. This is what I mean by a two-tailed test. Then this is 
huge amount of area, 0 0.6882. Now I gotta be careful because I'll have to change this value too. Then I want area of 0 0.05 on the left and area of 0 0.05 on the right. So let's go back to my calculator and repeat that calculation inverse T, but not 0 0.01. Oops, sorry, I have to bring it back. Distribution inverse T areas 0 0.005 degrees of freedom nine paste. And that's even more negative 3.24. So it's here and below that is one half of 1% and then three to four here and above is one half of 1%. And you still see that when you add those two small black tails, you get a total of 1%, but the area of your test is way, way bigger than that. So that's why the calculator calls the p-value 0 0.6882, because it's a two-tailed test. Let me bring that calculator back so you can see that 6882. Stats, tests, t-test, all these numbers not equal to zero, Calculate. And that's what the 6881346 is. Notice the calculator reminds you that the mean was 9.3, the standard deviation was 70.9, and the n was 10. I could do this one more time and have the calculator draw the picture for me because my picture is kind of messed up now, right? So with all this data, can the calculator draw the two-tailed test in magenta? And there's that 68% of the distribution that I've shaded. <clears throat> so even though the difference between the hotel chains on average was minus $9.30 a night. That difference was really small compared to the data that we had. And that difference, I cannot say, was due to anything but random chance. So I cannot reject, do not reject H naught. That is correct. And you could say this in English. I want you to practice saying it in English. There is insufficient evidence to conclude that the hotel prices between these two chains is different on average. The different was the two-tailed test. You should also be willing and able to graph this distribution and the target range and your test area here. I want to, this is a really good question. I want to do it one more time with a better graphic in Desmos. Let me stop sharing this. And let me open up a Desmos window because then you can see that distribution is shading even a little bit nicer. I open up a Desmos window and then I'll share it with you. I'll show you how to do a picture like this if you want to generate a picture for your homework or exam or anything. You can also draw them by hand. But on this functions list, the keypad is this keyboard in the lower left hand corner. Oh, excuse me, I have to share the screen. My fault. Okay, now I'm looking at Desmos just in an ordinary browser, Microsoft Edge. Keypad, lower left, show keypad, functions, distributions, 
T distribution right here. Let's do the T distribution with how many degrees of freedom? Nine, got it. Let's give this person a name, P sub nine. I can call it anything T distribution. I just call it T sub nine here. Let me resize these axes. Cause I just want to look at this from like minus four to four from, oh, minus 0.5 to 0.5. So X axis minus four to four. So I see this distribution nicely, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Good. Now let's shade from my test statistic minus 0 0.4146 down. Negative infinity to minus 0 0.4146. See, that's that large piece right there. Now I'm going to do the same graph but I'm gonna shade it at 1%, which I found was negative 3.2498. So I can compare negative 3.2498. And this is very hard to see, but down here in the very lower left, you see a little blue sliver. That is one half of 1%, you see the number right here, one half of 1% of the area under this curve. If I expand this greatly by zooming in, you'll see the blue part a little bit better. That blue part is one half of 1%, and this red part on this side was 34%. Now, could I make another blue part appear over here? Sure. Can I make another red part appear over here? Sure. So I could copy and paste these again. And do cumulative frequency from 0 0.4146. Let's make that one red. And let's make another blue curve here. So it's not a bad idea to play around with Desmos. Desmos can make these things a little bit more visual than your calculator screen. Your calculator can also draw this two-tailed test as we demonstrated. Let's put this at 3.2498 and above, 3.2498. Okay, good. I'll put away these instructions and just let you look at that curve and you see a little blue slivers on the left and on the right. And this giant red area, which is 68% of the area under that curve in pink. 1% in blue, half a percent on each side, 68% in pink, 34% on each side. So this was not a rare event. That test statistic ate up a lot of the area here. This is not random, or this error would not be caused by randomness. So this is, or I should say this error would be caused by just a random sample. So I cannot reject the null hypothesis. I wanna say one more thing about this problem, and you may have noticed this in your book. Do you see that sometimes they give the even answers and sometimes they give the odd answers? So she gave the even answers all the way up to 114 and then she switched to odd number answers. Ah, might have been fun if you could just look up the answer and see that we did it right. But we have done this right. You're just gonna have to practice it again yourself. Sometimes you can look up the even or odd number answers in the book. Okay, that was a pile of detail for a simple little problem, but they, they have a lot of steps that you're explaining. When you do things one step at a time, it's not impossible.
but there's a lot of detail in this problem. If that was good for you, then I'm pleased. Uh, and we still, in this session, have time if you want to ask another really quick question. Maybe we could sketch a problem. But we went into serious detail on that one. If you want to try another question, just to sketch it quickly, we could probably fit it in here in 10 or 12 minutes. But that's going to be a very good example for people to read through. I should say more carefully the critical value. You always call the critical value the even if it's calculated on the left or right equally in a two-tailed test, you always call this critical value, the value on the right-hand side. So in the problem here, you'd say the critical value is 3.2498. Oh, let me say one more thing also for the sake of the recording, because this really bothered people on the last homework. Sometimes, your calculator was giving you the number in scientific notation and people were not picking up on that. So I don't remember exactly what the number was, but there was some problem that we just did on the last homework. I think the p value turned out to be 2.31. Six or something, and then many more digits, and then an E, the negative four. So that means 2.316 times 10 to the negative four. But people were reading that incorrectly as 2.316. So when your calculator says 2.3, when it gives this e negative 4 there, they mean times 10 to the negative 4. This is a very small number. That means you move this decimal place four places to the left. So the correct reading of that number is 0 0.0002321. Six. That's the same number. So when they write times 10 to the negative fourth like that, that's called scientific notation. So remember your scientific notation. I had to squeeze that in there because that was not an uncommon mistake. People misread this on many papers. So when you see that e to the negative 4, 10 to the negative 4, you have to read that in scientific notation. That was a very tiny number. OK. Sorry, I almost forgot to mention that. And I wanted to mention that. If you have anything else on your mind there, just type it out or say it out, and we'll use the last few minutes to look at that.
little bit different setup today. I'm a little bit off pace. But to tell you the truth, I'm sending in our session here from a different location. So I don't have exactly the same setup as I do in my basement. Also, let me mention this, that when you hand in the homework tomorrow night and you pick up the exam, either tomorrow night, late, or Monday morning, uh, that's Tuesday, you come back, you know, you come back on Wednesday, maybe you pick up the exam Wednesday morning, but remember, you can come back to our session Wednesday. You wanna ask more specific questions that are similar to the exam, I don't mind at all. I won't answer the questions from the exam, but we could do similar problems. The problems on the exam are very much picked out of problems in the book. And maybe I changed the number, or maybe I worded it the way I preferred it. But they're really just the same problems that you're doing here in the book. So if you want to come back Wednesday with specific questions about problems like the exam, I don't mind at all.
Mm -hmm. I see your question. Let me look at it really quickly. Because I have another appointment I have to do, but I'll tell you worst case scenario. I will write this on a piece of paper and post it on the website. So first let's just, let me just look at it really quickly so I can see what one you're asking for. 62. Nolan alternative hypotheses from chapter nine, this is section nine one. So some of these following statements refer to the null hypothesis. Some of them refer to the alternative hypothesis. State the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis in the terms of the appropriate parameter mu or p. Okay, so this is a really good problem because it's asking you to correctly write down the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. So we could run through these, but I don't want to rush it. I'll tell you what I'll do. I will write down the answer to this problem neatly and then post it on our website this afternoon. And the question is, let me write this down for everybody who is in the recording later. Chapter nine, section one, problem 62, practice writing. The null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Null hypothesis H not alternative hypothesis. So you could say H one. The book says alternative hypothesis H a, but I find that really hard to write H a and not make it look like H not or H zero. So I don't mind if you write H a for alternative hypothesis. Most people write H one. I will write up answers to this and put it on our website so that, because it won't fit inside of five minutes here nicely. But this is a good problem to review. Let's do that. Now, uh, I have an appointment here at two. I might not get this up here first thing, but I'm gonna get the recording of this session up. I'm gonna get this paper scanned and up quickly, but maybe sometime later this afternoon, let's think uh, three o'clock, four o'clock, uh, let's say four o'clock or five o'clock, then I will just make this a link to problem 62 in section one of chapter nine on our website. And I'll alert people with an email. So you have to go to the week that has chapter nine, section one in it, which is a couple weeks ago. Okay, but I really like the question. Thank you for the question. Okay, other than that, if you have any other questions as they come up, you can send them to me an email and I could do similarly with them, post answers on the website. But I'll let you finish up your homework number nine and uh, clear your desk so you can start working on the exam after that. And you guys have a good afternoon. See you then.